uh, a theorem which actually applies in this most general setting where you don't have to, where, where you cannot assume basically any energy condition, is the, uh, this theorem, kinematic incompleteness theorem. Actually, uh, uh, I should probably have said they are called singularity theorems, but uh, maybe a better name would be incompleteness theorem because uh, the theorem doesn't really prove that there is a singularity somewhere, it just proves that you cannot continue your space-time beyond a um, certain region. Uh, so this um, kinematic incompleteness theorem that I proved with uh, Arvin Borda, Alan Guth, and Alan Guth several years ago um, very loosely stated it says the following that a space-time that is on average expanding, that is the average Hubble rate is positive, is past geodesically incomplete. I will give a more uh, accurate statement in a moment. But the important thing about this theorem is that it is a purely geometric theorem. It doesn't uh, assume any dynamics. That is, it doesn't uh, rely on Einstein's equations. You could have some other theory based on some other equations. Um, it also doesn't assume any energy conditions. Actually, both Alan and I mentioned this theorem when we were here 10 years ago uh, at Stephen's 60th birthday. And from that, you can actually figure out the average time it takes to publish a paper when you write it with Alan Guth. Um, okay, so a more precise statement of the theorem. Um, so first of all, I should say that uh, an ex expansion is not really a property of space-time. It is a property of a congruence of geodesics in that space-time. And we say that a space-time is expanding if it can be filled with a, an expanding congruence of commoving test particles, that is, geodesics. So uh, let these black lines represent these uh, expanding congruence of geodesics. And I want to consider some other geodesic observer, uh, different from uh, these test particles, who is moving through these uh, test particles. Um, now, I want to denote H, the Hubble expansion rate of the congruence, in the direction of motion of the observer. I'm not assuming that the space-time is isotropic, so the expansion rate may be different in different directions. So that's why I specify the direction. And uh, then the theorem statement, now with these definitions, is very simple. Is if the Hubble expansion rate averaged over this uh, world line is positive, then the world line cannot be past geodesically complete, cannot be complete to the past. Um, the physical reason for this uh, conclusion, actually the proof of the theorem is very elementary, and the uh, physical reason for this conclusion is easy to understand. If you follow the geodesic to the future, then the velocity of the observer is redshifted relative to these particles, and the observer moves slower and slower relative to the congruence. But if you follow it to the past, the observer moves faster and faster. And what you can prove is that in a finite proper time of the observer, this observer reaches the speed of light relative to the congruence, beyond which you cannot extend the geodesic. So this tells you that that's where you reach the boundary of your region of space-time, and this happens in a finite proper time of the observer, so the space-time is geodesically incomplete. Uh, now, it is an interesting uh, thing that even though uh, these geodesics of the congruence could be of infinite length, maybe they go all the way to past infinity, any other geodesic must be finite, to the, incomplete to the past. So this shows that the past, that this space-time region must have um, a past boundary. And you can actually show that this geodesic reaches the past boundary in a pretty short proper time. So the corollary is that inflating space-times must be past geodesically incomplete because inflation certainly is associated with expansion of the universe. And if the universe, uh, so if uh, you have this point in an inflating region, all the space-time to the past must also be inflating. And that indicates that inflationary universe must have a beginning. Alex, is the, in, in the 
No, h can be negative or positive. All we require is that h averaged over. Yeah, what I'm asking is whether h average has to be bounded from below by a positive number, or it's okay for it to slowly approach zero as you go backwards. Is that still? Uh, well, if it slowly approaches zero, uh, then uh, the average will be zero, right? Okay, so uh, now an interesting uh, proposal to avoid this conclusion was made by uh, these people, starting with Aguirre and Grattan. Uh, what they suggested is that, that uh, even though, the, uh, well, uh, for uh, simplicity, talking about De Sitter space as a prototype of inflation, uh, even though full De Sitter space cannot be filled by expanding congruence of geodesic, it can, has kind of the contracting and expanding parts, but half of the sitter space can be. And so what they said, okay, what if the error of time is reversed in a half of the sitter space? So you can do it this way with a null boundary between the two parts, or you can do it this way with a space-like boundary. And then uh, you would have bubbles nucleating, kind of uh, expanding in the upward direction, in the upper half, and in the lower half. You also can have inflation with bubbles kind of going upside down. Um, and, um, okay, this uh, avoids, of course, the conclusion of the theorem, but here you have to impose <laughs> some boundary condition at the surface where the arrow of time is reversed. And uh, for me, this amounts pretty much to a beginning. So, um, so I think I'm, I'm done with, the, uh, with my list of things here. Uh, with eternal inflation. So I think the conclusion is that eternal, uh, that inflationary universe, even though it is eternal to the future, um, should have some sort of a beginning in the past. <laughs>